ADBN Advocate Broadcasting Network. This is ADBN News, the headlines. Federal government makes progress to avert ASU strike to reconvene in September. Federal Minister of Housing and Urban Development, Architect Tangiwa, reveals public building insurance plan amid building collapse concerns. While Federal Capital Territory Minister, Barrister, Week A pledges 40,000 jobs as key objective of Abuja Industrial Park project. And on the foreign scene, Boss Overton leaves 10 dead, 35 injured in Limpopo, South Africa. In sports, 11 days of exciting competition, over 500 medals up for grabs as Paris Paralympics begins today. Good evening and welcome. My name is Chijo Kiyokafo. Now on the news in detail. Minister of Education, Professor Tahir Maman, has disclosed that federal government is making significant progress in efforts to prevent a nationwide strike by the Academic Staff Union of Universities. Professor Maman disclosed this following a closed-door meeting with ASU leadership in Abuja. He emphasized that the government is actively addressing the concerns raised by the union to ensure the welfare of Nigerian students. The federal government and ASU have agreed to reconvene on 6th of September to review the outcomes of their discussions and further deliberations aimed at resolving the ongoing issues. The meeting had in attendance Minister of State for Education, Dr. Yusuf Sununu, Permanent Secretary, Directors of Federal Ministry of Education, Immediate Past President of ASU, Professor Biodun Ogunyemi, and other executives of the union. Meanwhile, Speaker of the House of Representatives, Honorable Tajuddin Abbas, has climate, says climate change contributes to worsening farmer header clashes in the country. He made this known at a stakeholders forum on addressing the impact of climate change on farmer header clashes in Nigeria, organized by the Office of the Deputy Chairman, House Committee on Environment today. The event premiered the documentary Behind the Valley, which is a story of climate change and farmer header conflicts in Benue State. The speaker said as part of efforts to address the challenges, there is need to get rid of outdated herding and farming methods and adopt global trends in farming amidst climate change. Stakeholders called for collaborative effort between the federal government and the parliament. To making these changes, with state governors holding the assets on land use, the need for collaboration between states and the federal government in the face of crisis worsened by cl climate change is strongly advised. We must engage in smart agriculture across board. Numbers from countries compared us to read ourselves of cultural practices that must now evolve. The ripple effect of this forced displacement has been felt acutely in north central Nigeria, particularly the Benue Valley. This has ignited a cycle of violence with herders and farmers bearing the brunt of the conflict. Herders have been accused of encroaching on farmlands, damaging crops, and resorting to arm attacks in defense of their livestock. While farmers, on the other hand, have been accused of retaliatory attacks and, re and resisting herders' access to grazing fields, which of course, and our farmlands. The recent acceptance of this threat to human existence by the world-class leaders is a signal that the global development and protection policies should be framed around climate change. This is because climate change is the major factor undermining the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, and direct threat to world leaders' efforts at reducing extreme poverty. The solution is multifaceted, 
One of them is what my brother is advocating today, that is advocacy and enlightenment. Engagement with one another, and of course, looking for other solutions to ensure that uh, we're able to mitigate the effect of climate change in our environment by reducing our emissions, and also taking steps to ensure that our people are able to adapt to the adverse effects of climate change. Capital Territory, Barrister Nyesomwiki, has revealed that the Abuja Industrial Park in Idu will create at least 40,000 jobs for FCT residents upon completion. The minister made this statement during an inspection tour of the park. He said creation of employment remains a key objective of his administration. FCT correspondent Naomi Oleribe has more details. Abuja Industrial Park situated in Idu, when completed, is set to house 208 workshops and 200 factories focusing on the production of Made in Nigeria goods. After inspecting the facility, Minister of the Federal Capital Territory, Baris Tanyesom Wike, expressed satisfaction with the progress of the work. He emphasized that the park represents a significant opportunity for industrial production in the FCT, which is crucial for boosting economic development. If you are campaigns of not less than 40,000 jobs, you know what it means? It reduces the body, it reduces the rate of uh, unemployment. Two, it will grow the economy. It will grow the economy. And when it grows the economy, of course, like when I was riding with him, he told me one production that is which will be exported out. Which will be exported out. And that Nigeria has the raw material, but has not been able to harness it. The minister further added that the construction of access roads to the industrial park is vital to encourage companies to establish startups in the area. The government is providing the infrastructure that will lead for the development of this uh, uh, industrial park. And then, talking about uh, export, it's already a feasible. Remember, one of the incentives that can drive companies to come is where they are not taxed. And this is an incentive to so many companies. To when there is power, of course, what kills most businesses is because you have uh, 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 no stability of power, and, and that drives people away. Look at manufacturers. When they have no stability of power, the high cost of diesel to run their generators killed most of the businesses. But now you are sure that the power is there. Which means the industrial uh, goal. The Idu Industrial Park is being developed by Zebra Sea Group and is located west of Abuja. Upon completion, it is expected to be serviced by the Abuja Mass Rail Transit System, which will provide seamless transport for passengers from the city center through the Idu Interchange to Kubwa and the Namdazikiwe International Airport. Naomi Oleri Bay, ADBN News. Moving on, Minister of Housing and Urban Development, architect Ahmed Dengua, has revealed plans to ensure public buildings in Nigeria. The ministry is collaborating with relevant agencies to implement this initiative. Speaking in Abuja during the inauguration of the Board of Estate Surveyors and Valuers Registration Board of Nigeria, Architect Ngiwa emphasized the ministry's commitment to addressing building collapses by partnering with agencies to ensure that buildings are insured. The housing minister highlighted the role of estate surveyors in preventing building failures by conducting thorough property inspections and ensuring adherence to safety standards. He urged the board to be innovative and ensure professional professionalism and compliance. Chairman, estate surveyors and valuers Registration Board of Nigeria, uh, Dosu Fatokun, requested the minister's support in exempting the professional body from the federal government's recent move to stop funding for professional bodies and organizations. 
Nigeria Labour Congress confirms all national officials from 54 affiliate unions will accompany NLC President Comrade Joe Ajero to honour invitation from Nigeria Police Force. Comrade Ajero has been summoned over allegations related to terrorism financing and other charges. NLC General Secretary Comrade Emmanuel Oboaja in a circular instructed members to prepare Pre prepared for a nationwide strike if the president is detained. The circular is also called for peaceful processions and prayer sessions at state police headquarters as a show of solidarity. Interpol has disclosed the arrest of over 300 individuals linked to the notorious Black Axe criminal network and other associated groups following a major international operation. Interpol conducted Operation Jakal 3 from 10th April to 3rd July across 21 countries on five continents, targeting online financial fraud and the West African syndicates behind it. The operation resulted in over 300 arrests, the seizure of assets worth $3 million, and the dismantling of multiple criminal networks. Additionally, more than 400 suspects were identified and over 720 bank accounts were blocked. Director of Interpol's Financial Crime and Anti-Corruption Center, Dr. Isaac Ogeni, highlighted the alarming increase in financial fraud originating from West Africa. He stressed the importance of international cooperation to tackle these extensive criminal networks and reduce their impact on global communities. It will be recalled that the Nigerian Senate had previously raised concerns about a $500 million annual loss to cybercrime in the country. Nigeria Diaspora Voting Council has applauded President Bola Ahmed Tinubu and the federal government for the launch of the $10 billion Nigeria Diaspora Fund multi sectoral investment. Now, this initiative, led by Federal Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment, aims to empower Nigerians abroad to contribute to their homeland's economic development by attracting private sector and foreign direct investments. The statement by NITCOM says the fund, launched earlier this year, represents a significant advancement in engaging the diaspora community. Nigeria Diaspora Voting Council views the establishment of the Diaspora Fund as a positive commitment by the government offering Nigerians abroad opportunities to invest directly in Nigeria's growth. The council believes the initiative highlights the government's dedication to unearthing diaspora resources and paves the way for future initiatives, including diaspora voting. The council also sees the Diaspora Fund as a step forward toward achieving this goal, strengthening financial and participatory connections between the diaspora and Nigeria. In another development, Chairman CEO of the Nigerians in Diaspora Commission, Honorable Abike Dabiri Arewa, has called for greater partnerships between Africans on the continent and those in the diaspora to drive development across Africa. Speaking during a meeting with a delegation from the U.S. Africa Chamber of Commerce in Abuja today, Honorable Dabiri Arewa emphasized the crucial role of the diaspora in advancing Africa's growth. She highlighted Africa's immense potential, both in human and natural resources, and noted that international investments from the diaspora could propel the continent towards significant development, much like Asian countries have achieved. The NITCOM boss reaffirmed the Commission's commitment to supporting such investments and creating a conducive environment for their success. Leader of the U.S. Africa Chamber of Commerce delegation, Sa Sam Joe Madu, expressed their readiness to collaborate with NITCOM in transitioning Africa from a transactional to a real time investment economy. American entrepreneur Mr. Everett Davis also expressed his interest in, in, in investing in Nigeria, particularly in mining and agribusiness. He noted that Africa has the potential to match the development levels seen in Asia, Europe, and North America through strategic partnerships and investments. 
Independence National Electoral Commission has commenced permanent voter card distribution to new applicants across Edo State's local government areas today, 28 August 2024. INEC National Commissioner Mr. Sam Olumeku stated that PVCs will not be collected by third parties, emphasizing that all voters must pick up their cards in person. The distribution process began with the completion of PVC collection at the ward level, where over 120,000 cards were collected out of over 140,000 issued. This represents a 68.3% collection rate, the highest since the continuous voter registration CVR was introduced in 2015. Annex success was attributed to careful packaging of PVCs and direct voter communication. From August 28 to September 8, 2024, PVC collection will move. Voters are encouraged to collect their PVCs from any of the 18 local government area offices in Edo State. National Women Committee of the Senior Staff Association of Nigeria is advancing efforts to enhance the inclusion of women in union activism. Sanu, National Women Coordinator, Comrade Agnes Adana, NTI, disclosed these at the 8th National Women Conference held in Abuja. ADBN's labor correspondent, Ekaite Ibot, completes the story. Sanu National Women Coordinator Comrade Agnes Adanante emphasized the timeliness of the conference, highlighting the need for women to take a more active role in union activities. She noted that the global focus on increasing women's participation in both politics and unionism makes the discussion crucial. Even at, at our first conference, when we came on board mm -hmm. uh, in 2020, I made mention that women of San should begin to develop themselves because there will be a time when the women will take over the leadership of San. Mm -hmm. And I won't be surprised if it happens as soon as our current national president in you know, complete system. Former Sanu national women leader, Comrade Hadiza Kabiru, also addressed the gathering, urging further discuss on the challenges women face in union activism. She pointed out that awareness of the barriers preventing women from mainstreaming into union activities is essential for progress. Women should feel free to aspire to take the leadership of the, you know, union. Not that you will be given peanuts or women commission. I don't think, for me, I don't, you know, left to me, there wouldn't have been even the women commission. Come out. Is the resources you have up here, you know, your enthusiasm to serve selflessly. Because in union, we are not political. You know, it's service to humanity. So, and you know, women generally, we are caring. And I want to believe that once the women, you know, began to aspire to the top leadership position at the branch, they became, they become the chairpersons at the national level, they become the president. At least it will give women some kind of level of acceptability. The conference themed mainstreaming women into union activism attracted San women from across the country, signaling a significant step towards greater gender inclusion in union affairs. Ikaite Ibut, EDBN News. Still on gender-related matters, Inspector General of Police IGP Kayode Egbetokun has appointed Assistant Inspector General Roda Adetutu Olofo as the new Force Secretary in a significant step toward enhancing gender representation within the Nigeria Police Force. This appointment underscores the IGP's commitment to promoting gender inclusivity and empowering women in key leadership roles. Police Force Public Relations Officer ACP Olumoyewa Adejo 
Ajabi released a statement today stating that the appointment is part of the IGP's broader vision to improve the efficiency of the NPF by placing women in key positions, aligning with global trends in law enforcement that value diverse leadership. The IGP reaffirmed his commitment to gender inclusivity as an essential part of the police force's evolution emphasizing that it will help strengthen community relations and overall policing effectiveness in the country. Meanwhile, Lagos Metropolitan Area Transport Authority has disclosed commencement of partial operations for the Lagos Mass Transit Red Line Rail today. This new rail line is part of the Lagos Strategic Transport Master Plan, which includes six rail lines and one monorail. Lamata's spokesperson, Mr. Kolawale Ojelabi, said the Red Line Rail will offer free rides and run four daily trips between Oyungbo and Agbado. The rail line is designed to connect Lagos with Ogun State, accommodating many workers and business owners commuting from Ogun to Lagos. The project has reached this milestone following comprehensive planning, staff training, installation of security features, and a successful six-week trial run conducted without passengers. Starting today, the red line will operate with non-fee paying passengers in organized groups to gather feedback before the official launch of commercial op operations. This partial operation phase is similar to the test phase of the blue line. The first phase of the red line spans 27 kilometers from Agbado to Oyingbo, aiming to provide a reliable and affordable transportation option, reduce traffic congestion, and enhance the quality of life for Lagos residents. You're watching ADBN News at 7. Remember, you can watch us on DSTV channel 258, on Star Times channel 140, on Avo TV app, Limex World TV app, and Niger TV app. For more stories, visit our website on www.adbntv.com. Stay with us for more stories right after this break. Welcome to the world where innovation meets opportunity, where ideas become empires. This is Market TV. I am a Dorian Flannan, and every week I'll be taking you inside the dynamic world of marketing and commercial business. From groundbreaking startups to big businesses, Market TV brings you the best pricing and latest goods on display. It's all about understanding your audience and staying ahead of the trends. Witness the creative processes that drive the various brands. Join us as we dive deep into the strategies that shape the commercial landscape. From streets to traditional advertising and social media, we cover it all. Whether you're a seasoned professional or an aspiring entrepreneur, Market TV provides the insights you need to thrive. This show gave us the tool to turn our vision into reality. So, if you're ready to master the market, tune into Market TV every Saturday at 6 p.m. In a world of overwhelming voices where everyone has different opinion on different issues, it is important that we bring the core issue to the fore. Join me, Nancy Bonigo, on Softline as we lend our voices to inform and influence your thoughts and actions. This is not just mere talk, it is an invocative program that touches the core of our existence. No matter what I see, enough it make mouth heavy to talk them. That's now why people they talk. You know what thing they worry you, but you know go fit take help yourself. In this kind of situation now, what if they really no talk to her now? What if they way forward? They go bury our chairman on Thursday. Mm. We go remain here. Make we talk good where we they see good, and where we no say we not they see good, make we also they talk them. No woman, no mother desire to know the grave of his child. The bank manager, the bank executive, they are the one the government should first place. 
People They Talk, the show on Monday to Friday by 5 p.m. on Top ADBN TV. And you're welcome back. Federal government has advanced its efforts to enhance the effectiveness of the whistleblowing policy by drafting a bill aimed at providing legal protection for whistleblowers. This move seeks to address challenges affecting the policy's implementation and encourage more citizens to report corruption and misconduct in government operations. Speaking at a sensitization workshop on the whistleblowing policy, Minister of Finance and Coordinating Minister of the Economy, Mr. Wale Dun, emphasized the government's dedication to transparency, accountability and integrity. He noted that since the policy's launch in 2016, it has led to significant financial recoveries, including over 83 billion naira, $609 million and 5.4 million euros between 2017 and 2023. Mr. Edun explained that the draft bill, which will be presented to the National Assembly, aims to create a robust legal framework that ensures whistleblowers' protection, confidentiality, and prompt action on reports. Permanent Secretary for Special Duties, Mr. Okokon Ekenam Udo, highlighted the whistle that the whistleblowing policy's success in exposing corrupt practices contributing to transparency in both public and private sectors. In her closing remarks, Permanent Secretary of the Federal Ministry of Finance, Mrs. Lydia Shehu Jeffia, expressed the importance of protecting whistleblowers' identity to encourage more individuals to come forward. She also called for improvements in reporting mechanisms to ensure concerns are addressed efficiently and transparently. The draft bill is a critical step towards strengthening Nigeria's whistleblowing regime and reinforcing the government's fight against corruption. Operatives of Nigeria Security and Civil Defense Corps, Akwaibom State Command, have arrested four suspects for vandalizing power transmission lines and engaging in illegal mining activities. This was disclosed by the State Commander of NSCDC, Engineer Eluwade Eluyemi, at a press briefing in Uyo, saying that two suspects were arrested in Eket's local government area for criminal conspiracy and legal transportation of solid minerals. Engineer Eluyemi also said two other suspects were arrested for vandalizing power transmission lines in Mpat and in local government area, thereby causing power outage in most communities. We received an intelligence on the illegal mining activity at Ibeno Beach of Ibeno local government. And we quickly mobilized our men at midnight of 25th August 2024 towards the mining site. These two suspects are one, Godwin Ben Peter, male, 39 years old, and Samuel Inse Okon, male, 28 years old. The truck contains 1,200 bags of the solid mineral suspected to be an iron hull. Two suspects, woman Friday James, male, 27 years old, and Ekwedem Samuel Robinson, male, 25 years old, We are arrested for vandalizing power transmission lines in Ekot Akpan Okop, village in Ipadeni, local government of Akwebom State. A suspect, while stating reasons for his offense, said his previous job was not financially sustainable, prompting his involvement in the illegal act. Because of uh, uh, company come our community, so our working carry the work, give only their people. They no agree give us, so we can't hear the same this work because the work where they do no favor for me. Yeah, they do dead body work. I know for me the thing that disturb my chest. So as I come here, say me and my friend come here, say you get the place where then they pay forty thousand before you join the the work. Now make we go do this thing. 
Commandant Eluade, who frowned at such acts, stressed the negative impact on the economy while calling on youths to desist from such activities as the command will not relent in its efforts in combating crime in the state. Residents of the Rumo Duere community in Elelewo clan, Obiakwa local council of River State are abandoning their homes following a fresh oil spill allegedly caused by Shell Petroleum Development Company. The spill, which reportedly began today, is believed to have originated from an aging ruptured pipeline owned by SPDC, though the cause has not been officially confirmed. Paramount ruler of Oduere, Eze Kenneth Ndamati Oto, expressed his dismay after inspecting the site of the spill. He described the environmental damage as devastating, pointing out that underground water resources and farmland have been heavily contaminated. Eze Ndamati Oto called on both the state and federal government to intervene and help restore the community's damaged resources. Meanwhile, an opinion leader in the community, Dr. Martin Enwoka, further stressed the spill's harmful impacts on health, citing contamination of drinking water and destruction of farm produce. SPDC responded in a statement assuring that the oil spill has been contained. Media Relations Manager for Shell Nigeria Exploration and Production Company Limited, Mrs. Gladys Afam Anadu, stated that the leak was reported on 21st August, which led to an immediate halt in production and the deployment of an oil spill response team. KB State Governor Dr. Nasser Idris has pledged to reconstruct bridges and roads damaged by recent floods in the Suru and Mayama local government areas of the state. The governor committed to this yesterday during an inspection of the washed away bridge along the Suru Kawara Dakengari Road and the destruction of rice farms in Suru. Governor Idris emphasized his administration's dedication to supporting all residents and ensuring food security across the state. Member of the State House of Assembly representing Suru constituency, Honorable Faruku Maisedan, praised the governor's efforts to aid farmers with essential facilities and resources. In Kaduna Executive Secretary, Kaduna State Emergency Management Agency, Dr. Usman Hayatu Mazadu, has reported that recent floods destroyed over 200 houses in Zaria and Sabungari local government areas of the state. Addressing the media, Dr. Hayatu Mazadu stated that despite flood predictions and warnings, some residents did not evacuate leading to significant damage. The state government has undertaken measures to mitigate the flood's impact, including desilting drainage systems and conducting awareness campaigns. Dr. Hayatu Mazadu highlighted key issues contributing to the flood's impact to include inadequate drainage systems, ref refuse dumping, and structures erected within waterways, amongst others. He urged residents, particularly those in flood-prone areas, to evacuate immediately and take advantage of alternative farming lands provided by the government. He emphasized that while proactive measures were taken based on predictions from the Nigerian Meteorological Agency, the recent flood had still caused extensive damage. Nigeria Immigration Service has deported Zimbabwean Bishop Ibn K. Niwatawi for participating in a Methodist church leadership election while on a tourist visa. NIS Public Relations Officer DCI Kenneth Udo revealed that Bishop Niwatawi was apprehended on 24th August 2024 in Yola, Adamawa State. He had arrived in Nigeria on 21st August 2024 using a tourist visa which is intended solely for tourism purposes. Bishop Niwatawi's involvement in the church election was deemed a violation of the terms associated with his tourist visa as outlined in the Nigeria Visa Policy 2024. 
The NIS statement emphasized that while the service supports lawful foreign investments and social activities, it will not tolerate violations of immigration laws. The Comptroller General of the NIS, will, with ministerial approval, has ordered Bishop Niwatawi's immediate repatriation. The NIS reaffirmed its commitments to national security and monitoring the activities of foreigners in Nigeria. Six Polish students detained by Nigerian security agencies in Kano during the hashtag End Bad Governance in Nigeria protest have been released. Poland's Ministry of Foreign Affairs confirmed today. The students were arrested earlier in August, accused of being involved in the protest against government policies and economic hardship. The Polish Foreign Ministry, via their official social media handle, appreciated the Nigerian authorities for the release. The students, along with a teacher from Warsaw University, were in Nigeria for academic studies when the protests erupted. Polish Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Andrzej, uh, Andrzej Zetna had previously stated that the students were in the wrong place at the wrong time. It will be recalled that the National Security Agency had accused the students of playing a suspicious role during the protest, but their release marks the end of their brief ordeal. Nigerian Navy has buried Lieutenant Commander Gideon Gwaza, the base operations officer of the Nigerian Navy forward operating base in Boni, who drowned while rescuing 59 crew members from a distressed vessel. The ceremony took place at the military cemetery in Abuja. The burial was attended by Chief of Naval Staff, Vice Admiral Emmanuel Ogala and several senior officers from the Defense and Services Headquarters. Lieutenant Commander Gwaza died on 30th July during a rescue operation at the Okpobo Field near the Okpobo River. River. His heroism was highlighted in related reports, including the Navy's recent destruction of a 2 million liter illegal refinery in Rivers and the establishment of new naval facilities in Ogun State. You're watching ADBN News at 7. Watch us on DSTV channel 258, on Star Times channel 140, Avo TV app, Limex World TV app, and Niger TV app. For more stories, visit our website on www.adbntv.com. More stories coming up after this timeout. Welcome to the Niger Delta, a region of incredible beauty and stark contrast. From its breathtaking landscapes to its rich cultural heritage, this is a place where history and modernity collide. But beneath this serene surface lies a story of struggle and resilience. The Niger Delta is the lifeblood of Nigeria's economy, home to vast oil reserves that fuel the nation. Yet, it is a land where the people fight for their share of the wealth. Join us on the program Niger Delta Today as we explore the heart of the Niger Delta, discover the vibrant cultures, the struggles for environmental justice, and the stories of the people who call this place home. This is the Niger Delta, a land of contrast, a story of resilience, a journey of hope. Don't miss our exclusive series, Niger Delta Today, every day at 12 noon, only on ADBN TV. Witness the untold stories, experience the journey, be part of the change. One hour of your daily dose of news from around the world. Whether it's a diplomatic breakthrough, a humanitarian crisis, or a scientific discovery, Global Digest gives you a deeper understanding of the world around you. Join me, Ama Marcus. Let's stay ahead of the curve with conversations that are shaping our planet at 11 a.m. on DSC Channel 258 and on Star Time Channel 140. Global Digest, your window to the world's current affairs. Only 
on Advocate Broadcasting Network. Welcome back. Turning our attention to the foreign scene, a bus traveling from Zimbabwe to Johannesburg has overturned in South Africa's northeastern Limpopo province, resulting in the tragic deaths of 10 people and leaving 35 others injured. The local transport ministry confirmed the accident, which occurred just before midnight on Tuesday. According to authorities, the bus lost control after driving over a roundabout at high speed causing it to overturn and affecting five men and five women believed to be foreign nationals. The driver, who was reportedly new to his job and unfamiliar with the area, was unable to prevent the accident. The injured passengers were quickly transported to local hospitals for treatment. The local government expressed condolences to the families of the deceased and urged motorists to drive cautiously and remain alert to their surroundings at all times. Now, at least nine Palestinians have been killed by Israeli forces in the northern occupied West Bank, according to the Palestinian health officials. The Israeli military described the action as a counter-terrorism operation to thwart terror in Jenin and Tokam. Palestinian reports indicate that main roads into Jenin have been blocked and clashes are taking place in the city's refugee camp. Israeli Foreign Minister Mr. Israel Kaz stated that the Israeli Defense Forces have been operating with full force in Jenin and Tokam to dismantle Iranian Islamic terror infrastructures. He accused Iran, which supports Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad, of trying to open a new front against Israel in the West Bank. Meanwhile, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas has caught short a trip to Saudi Arabia to monitor the situation in the West Bank, according to Palestinian media. U.S. prosecutors have issued revised charges against former U.S. President Mr. Donald Trump related to his alleged attempts to interfere in the 2020 election. The revisions address a Supreme Court ruling that grants presidents broad immunity from prosecution for official acts complicating the case against Mr. Trump. The updated indictment focuses on Mr. Trump's actions as a political candidate rather than as a sitting president. The former president denies all allegations, including claims that he pressured officials to overturn the election results, spread false information about election fraud, and tried to use the 6th January Capitol riot to delay Mr. Joe Biden's victory certification. The revised indictment filed by special counsel Jack Smith maintains four charges against Trump. Conspiracy to defraud the U.S., conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding, attempting to obstruct an official proceeding, and conspiracy against rights. However, it now specifies that Mr. Trump acted as a private citizen. Mr. Trump, who has pleaded not guilty to all charges, called the revised indictment a witch hunt and demanded its dismissal. The case is unlikely to go to trial before the 2024 election as Mr. Trump's legal team has signaled they will seek more time to prepare. Ukrainian drones have struck two fuel depots in Russia, igniting fires and marking the latest in a series of attacks against Russian oil and gas facilities since Moscow's full-scale offensive against Ukraine. According to Rostov Governor Mr. Vasily Golubev, one attack caused a fire at a fuel depot in the Rostov region with firefighters walking to contain the blaze. No residential homes were threatened and no injuries were reported, but the depot targeted is reportedly involved in supplying Russian occupation forces. A separate drone attack has led to a large fire at an oil storage facility in Prolestak, uh, Proletarsk, also in the Rostov region, which, was, which has been burning for 10 days. Additionally, Ukrainian drones targeted an oil depot in Kotel Nich, Kirov region, which is approximately 1,100 kilometers from the Ukrainian border. 
Governor of Kirov Oblast, Mr. Alexander Sokolov, noted that two drones were shot down while three that fell on the plant premises were quickly extinguished with no damage or injuries reported. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Mr. Volodymyr Zelensky has praised these strikes as part of a broader strategy to bring about a just end to the conflict. Now in sports, 2024 Paris Paralympics is set to commence later today with a spectacular opening ceremony at the iconic Champs Elysees in Paris, marking the start of the eagerly awaited Games. A total of 4,400 athletes from 128 nations, each with a physical or cognitive disability, are expected to compete in the Paralympics. Paralympics. Nigeria will be represented at the Games by 24 athletes across four sports, namely para athletics, para badminton, para powerlifting, and para table tennis. The Games will feature 11 days of top tier competition across 22 sports with 549 medals up for grabs. Organizers have announced that over 2 million tickets have already been sold as the Paris Paralympics prepare to kick off. Nigeria Premier Football League Board has approved a 50% increase in referee pay alongside the provision of new communication gadgets ahead of the 2024-2025 NPFL season. President of the Nigeria Referees Association, Malam Sani Zuberu, explained that the pay raise is intended to motivate referees and enhance their performance for the upcoming season. He also confirmed that referees are also currently undergoing training in preparation for the league's kickoff on Saturday. Malam Zuberu noted that referees are being trained to effectively use the new communication devices, which will be employed by all four referees for each of the 380 NPFL matches, including those in the Federation Cup. The new NPFL season is set to begin this weekend, with defending champions Rangers International of Enugu facing El Kanemi Warriors of Maiduguri in the opening match. Still staying with sports, Minister of Sports Development, Senator John Eno, has pledged his support for the Federation of African University Games, which will be held in Nigeria next month. The sports minister promised that his ministry will do everything possible to ensure the successful hosting of the event during a courtesy visit from the organizing committee in his Abuja office. Senator Eno also indicated that following the Paralympic Games, he plans to lead a delegation to the Ministry of Education to explore potential collaborations aimed at enhancing school sports development. Chairman of the Organizing Committee for the FASU Games, Dr. Mohamed Bawa, raised concerns about the $200 mandatory visa fee. He requested that the minister work with his counterparts in the Ministry of Interior to secure a waiver for students. The 11th African in University Games are scheduled to take place from 20th to 29th September to be co-hosted by Lagos State University and the University of Lagos. National defender Juan Isguerdo has tragically passed away at the age of 27 following a collapse on the pitch during a Copa Libertadores match. Now, this the Urugu Uruguayan player collapsed due to cardiac arrest on 22nd August while playing against Sao Paulo. He had been receiving treatment for an irregular heartbeat at the Albert Einstein Hospital in Sao Paulo where his condition, initially stable, worsened over the last few days. National shared the heartbreaking news on social media, expressing their sorrow. The club extended their condolences to his family, friends and loved ones, marking a somber moment for the team and fans alike. Isguerdo was substituted into the march at halftime but collapsed in the 84th minute without contact with any other players. He received immediate medical attention on the field and was rushed to an intensive care unit. Despite the care, 
His condition deteriorated and he was put on a ventilator before passing away. In honor of Isguedo, Uruguay's first and second division football leagues were postponed over the weekend. Now this is where we draw the curtains on AB, ADB and TV news tonight. Remember to watch us live on DSTV channel 258, on Star Times channel 140, Avo TV app, Limex World TV app and Niger TV app. For more stories, visit our website on www.adbntv.com. You can also watch us live from every part of the world by logging on to www.adbntv.com forward slash live. My name is Chijoke Okafo. Many thanks for watching. Good evening. ADBN Advocate Broadcasting Network